my name is Jeremy Middleton. I'm a first year medical resident. I'm a prelim resident going into radiology next year. My talk is gonna be serum creatinine to screen for risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. So just in general, what my myth is, true or false, the serum creatinine level is the best single screening tool to decide whether to give or withhold IV contrast. Uh, brief outline what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna give you some background information on the topic and relevance of the topic, very briefly into the pathophysiology. We're gonna go over some of the risk factors, which are very important for prevention, and then discuss some of the data regarding serum creatinine, as well as data regarding a different value, which is the calculated EGFR. Um, then we'll get into the conclusions, and then you guys get to vote. Um, so what is contrast-induced nephropathy? There are different definitions, and that has made the literature previously um, very convoluted, but from the European Society of Urogenital Radiology, the generally accepted uh, definition is a condition in which a decrease in renal function, and even here we have two definitions, either an increase in creatinine by 25% or by an absolute value of 0.5 occurs within three days of intravascular administration of contrast. And then this is important in the absence of an alternative etiology, which in many studies can be very difficult to tell. Um, clinically, there's often a transient increase in creatinine. You can have proteinuria. It's very rare to have oliguria. Um, and then there's a controversial effect on, in terms of long term, is this just a lab value, or is there actually some kind of mortality change? Um, the pathophysiology essentially contrast induces renal vascular changes. There's a direct effect leading to release of adenosine, endothelian, reactive oxygen species, and causing vasoconstriction, which leads to medullary ischemia. Um, there's also believed to be a direct effect and direct cytotoxicity on the cells. Um, and this is actually exacerbated by other insults as well, including diabetes, hypertension, nephrotoxic medications. Uh, mechanism kind of underscores some attempts at pharmacological intervention. Some have tried adenosine antagonists, but none of that's really shown anything. In terms of risk factors, the most significant risk factor is pre-existing kidney disease. So really trying to figure out what patients have pre-existing kidney disease is our key to figuring out who is at risk. The risk also increases with numerous other factors, um, diabetes, and especially diabetic nephropathy. And so in combination with CKD, it has a higher risk than just CKD alone, age greater than 70, uh, dehydration or really hypovolemia, um, any kind of nephrotoxic medications, and then cardiac effects as well. Um, you'll see a lot of prior studies that um, I'll briefly review showed um, were done in patients who were receiving cardiac angiography. And so these are patients going for cath, at which point you're already talking about possible CHF, myocardial infarction, um, potentially hypotension. And so this really compounds our effect at figuring out, well, is it the contrast or the hypotension? Um, a big one I just want to highlight also is known or suspected acute renal failure. A lot of what we're going to talk about, including creatinine and GFR, is in patients with stable renal function. Anyone coming in with an AKI or some acute change, it's a completely different story about what the risk is. So incidence and outcomes. The um, incidence varies in the literature as you must exclude other causative factors. As we all know, a nephrologist's favorite word is multifactorial. Um, <laughs> and so it can be very challenging to figure out, was it the hypotension or the contrast that caused them to go into renal failure? Um, also, selection bias. CKD patients in general don't receive contrast. Uh, and then a lot of these studies also have a lack of a control group, and so it's hard to tell. Um, Long-term complications and outcomes also depend on the setting. Uh, there was uh, a lot of trials within the cardiac literature that showed a strong association of AKI with renal failure and even mortality, ranging from 13 to 34 percent in a year. So it's pretty significant to hear that after someone got contrast, they had a mortality of that bump compared to someone who didn't. But again, this is in the setting of a lot of other factors. So now I'm going to try and get into more studies that are done more recently, a lot on outpatient CT scans in patients with CKD. Um, in general, you know, as far as determining whether or not you can give contrast, this is a clinical decision. So you have to balance the risks of giving and withholding contrast. The, the risks obviously worsening nephropathy, renal function, and possibly even progression to dialysis versus the risks of not giving contrast, which are usually not elicited, which would be non-diagnostic scan, lack of a diagnostic scan, or lack of intervention. Um, and so the incidence, morbidity, and rate of dialysis is linked to the extent of CKD. Um, and so that's one of the things we'll get into is, you know, in terms of determining the risk of actually giving the contrast is what's the risk this person's going to end up on dialysis. And so therefore, it's very clear that we need to find out how can we estimate a given patient's risk of progressing, of having higher mortality and dialysis um, after receiving contrast in order to try and make that decision of whether or not this scan 
outweighs the benefit of the risk. This is just kind of showing maybe, you know, somewhere, that, do we use contrast, do we not? Do we just give steroids, Vanco and Zosin? Do we just give heparin? What, what's the best way to approach it? So this is about risk stratification with creatinine and really talking about what is the threshold value? What value would tell us they're at higher risk? Creatinine is not sensitive or specific for renal function. You can have a, a frail elderly patient with a very low creatinine and abnormal renal function. You can have a young male who's quite large who has a high creatinine and a normal renal function. So the degree of CKD is not really clear, and thus the degree of risk from a creatinine alone is not clear. What are people doing right now? So um, in the 2006, they did a survey of radiologists where they just asked, what is your creatinine cutoff at your institution? 35% of them used a creatinine of 1.5, 27% used 1.7, 31% used greater than 2. The ACR, the American College of Rec Radiology, recommends greater than 2, but provides only minimal evidence. At this institution, 2 is typically the cutoff value that's used. Um, ESUR, which is the Eurogenital Society, uh, or the European Society of Urogenital Radiology, excuse me, recommends actually against screening with creatinine and rather using the EGFR. Interestingly, in that survey of radiologists, only 8% actually used EGFR. Almost all of them used creatinine. So this is a study that was done that, um, in patients in an outpatient ED who came in with abdominal pain, and they aimed to identify the incidence of CKD, defined as an EGFR of less than 60, among patients with a creatinine of less than 1.5. So using basically different thresholds and seeing how many of these patients actually would have CKD. What they showed was that the creatinine threshold of 1.5, that failed to identify 40% of patients with an EGFR of less than 60 at 1.5. And decreasing a creatinine threshold will identify more patients at risk, but you'll also have more false positives. So if the threshold is 1, you'll identify everyone with CKD, but you'll have loads of people who probably don't have CKD who would be able to get a study or be low risk with the study. On the flip side, if you increase the creatinine higher, you will miss out on more patients with CKD. So what about risk stratifying with estimated GFR? The estimated GFR can be calculated using an equation from the, um, uh, it's basically an equation done on a large uh, retrospective study of patients where they accounted for age, race, sex, and serum creatinine and used that to stratify GFR. And essentially, one of the recommendations right now from the ESUR are saying the thresholds of risk, people are at risk with less than 60 if they're getting intra-arterial administration, so cath or radiologic procedure, and less than 45 for IV administration. And I'll get into some of the data for that. So this is incidence and outcomes of contrast-induced nephropathy after CT in patients with CKD. So this is 520 patients with CKD. All of them were pre, this was a prospective trial. They were all referred to a nephrologist beforehand and they all got NAC and IV fluid prior to an outpatient CT with contrast. They had their creatinine measured at 48 hours, which is when you would see this, and they also were followed for up to 400 days for overall morbidity and mortality. So what is the incidence of CIN? Um, it was overall about 2.5%. This table is kind of busy, but you can see here in the 45 to 59 EGFR group, the risk was 0%. In the 30 to 44 group, the risk was 2.9%. And then in the less than 30 group, it was as high as 12%. Uh, so this is significant in that you can actually stratify risk by EGFR. What happened in terms of the mortality or renal mortality? This is looking at the cumulative survival up to, uh, looks like 40 months they put it out to, um, at renal survival, so basically need to go onto dialysis. And this is very significant and probably the most important uh, picture I have here and that it shows that in patients who were CIN positive with an EGFR less than 30, their renal mortality completely drops off. And this was statistically significant compared to those who had an EGFR of less than 30 but didn't have CIN. Now, was this due to the CIN? There's, there's no control group, so we don't actually know. Are these patients who were just at high risk anyway, had some other factor going on, which is why they got CIN and why their uh, mortality was so high? It's unclear, but this is very clear evidence that there are um, long-term outcome uh, deficits in patients who develop CIN with an EGFR, especially less than 30. So this would be a very high risk group. Um, in comparison, this is looking at some other trials. These were all randomized controlled trials where they looked at patients, again, with CKD, and they said, okay, with a baseline serum creatinine at different ranges, you know, what, at what cutoff threshold do you have a high incidence of CIN? So these are general, their rates of CIN, and 
this is using various thresholds, either a serum creatinine greater than 2 to 2.5 or an EGFR of less than 40 to, 40 to 45. Um, and the rates were pretty similar overall. You can see these are differing based on the definitions you use, but even as high as 1.3 to 3.9 up to 6%. Um, another thing to note is that in all of these studies, they did mortality up to as high as a year and showed absolutely no effect. None of these patients went to dialysis and none of these patients um, had mortality. The thing to note that's very interesting is that um, also they had very few patients with an EGFR of actually less than 30. So almost all of these are in that 30 to 45 range. This is um, another study looking at incidence and outcomes of contrast-induced AKI following CT. This is 400 patients with CKD, EGFR of less than 60, but a repeat creatinine at two days. Their average initial creatinine was about 1.4, and they had no patients with an EGFR of less than 30. You can see the rates about here. The EGFR of less than 45 had an overall 9.8 to 11.8% incidence of CIN, and those with an EGFR of greater than 45 had 2.5 to 7%. However, it's interesting to note if you go to this less than 45 group and look at the outpatients at a 0.5 threshold, uh, oh, greater than 45, excuse me, at the 0.5 threshold, the risk is almost 1%. So in patients who have a, actually greater than 45, EGFR, as an outpatient, the risk was quite low. And there was no association between that and hospitalization, dialysis, or mortality. It was only at one month. So this is actually the comparison. They don't compare the rates of CIN, but they do look and say, this is a retrospective review of almost 30,000 CT scans over 10 years and adult patients, inpatients, all with stable renal function. None of these patients had acute changes. And they compared EGFR and serum creatinine thresholds to try and optimize identification of at-risk patients. So this is pretty much what we're talking about. And you can see, if you're screening by an EGFR of less than 45, they identified 8.7% of patients at risk as opposed to 7.4, which you would see for a serum creatinine of greater than 1.5. This is very busy, and my markers actually jumped up here. But the two areas I really wanted to point out were right here, uh, this specific area. And then also, um, you can see, this is basically looking at patients with a creatinine of greater than or equal 1.5, but an EGFR in the 45 to 59 range, which we're saying is low risk. This is a low risk area, is the 49 to 45 to 59. You will identify 20% of them as being at risk by using a creatinine of 1.5. In contrast, if you're saying a creatinine of less than 1.5, you can see it, you'll hit 0% of the patients in the EGFR, less than 30 area. If you were to screen by a creatinine of greater than two, so let's say two is the threshold, it's more specific in that you won't include anyone who would probably be fine to get a CT, but you will miss half a percent of the EGFR less than 30 and 6.5% of the less than 45 ones. If you do by greater than 1.5, 20% of the patients you identify will be wrong and will actually be low risk with an EGFR greater than 45 and flag them but you'll fail to detect about a third total, or really just 3% of the total patients with an EGFR of 30 to 44. So just in summary, using a threshold of 1.5, you'll wrongly identify 20% of patients, and you will miss 3% of moderate risk patients. So using an EGFR of less than 45 instead of these creatinine thresholds would increase the number of inpatients identified at risk for CIN, but reduce misidentification of patients. Some general conclusions. Pre-existing CKD is the most significant risk factor for CIN. Creatinine is not sensitive or specific for detecting degree of renal insufficiency. And no serum creatinine level can identify all patients at risk without overestimating risk for others. Incidence of CIN is about 2 to 3% overall. It's low when the EGFR is greater than 45, 3 to 9% when it's less than 45, and highest when less than 30. Uh, there's numerous other things that are associated with CIN. And it can be associated with increased dialysis after a contrast enhanced CT, especially in patients with an EGFR of less than 30. These are my references. Any questions? I mean, I thought, you know, I thought this was good um, in terms of the creatinine, but I, it's still really not clear to me that we know enough about it. Would, we were, I was talking to Jeremy. It would be great if we had some kind of scoring system that included all the different risk factors, diabetes, whatever, in addition to renal function um, to try and really come up with an actual risk, you know, like your patient has a 5% risk of developing, you know, acute contrast 
induced nephropathy or developing you know, renal failure to the degree that they will need dialysis. I mean, it would be great if we could have that kind of information because we don't. And um, I think that everybody kind of, well, not everybody, I tend to overestimate the risk um, or over magnify the risk because of fear. You know, the fear because, and it's to some degree the fear of the unknown because we really, I don't know what the risk is. Um, I actually thought it was much higher than these numbers. Um, but um, there certainly is risk, um, and it, it would be great if there were, there were other studies that would, you know, allow us, or some other method that would allow us to really quantify the risk so that we can actually make a rational decision when we're trying to decide whether to, you know, give contrast. So let's vote. So how many people think that um, the serum creatinine level is the best single con screening tool to decide whether to give or withhold IV contrast? So did Jeremy make the case that uh, this is or is not a good tool compared to other things that we at least currently have? Um, how many people think that this statement is true, that creatinine is the best thing we should all be using that, which most of us have been using, including myself? How many think that it's plausible? And how many think that it's busted? All right. So hopefully we'll start looking at GFR, estimated GFR. Um, and we will bust it. Thank you.